All right. Thank you, Trevor and Richard, for appearing on my podcast. I'm really excited to speak with you. Thank you for having me, having us. <laughs> cool. um, so I want to ask you both. I ask everyone this first. You know, tell me how you got interested in the work that you're doing now. Um, maybe you can start, Trevor. Oh, yeah. So um, the work that I'm doing, my undergrad degree was in journalism, uh, but I kind of quickly discovered maybe like halfway through college that um, I I was too opinionated. All the feedback that I got on my pieces, um, on my homework um, was always like, you're inserting your opinion too much into this. So I kind of decided then to go to go into like the advocacy communications route. Um, and so I was always in kind of um, the housing space and I was in the housing space in college, affordable housing space. Um, and then coming out of college, um, I worked at this PR firm that works with nonprofits. And that's kind of what gave me all like the comms chops and like set me on this comms path. Um, went to a think tank for a little while. And it's there that I met um, the this researcher, Dr. Sandy Darity, who, um, and Dr. Derek Hamilton, who were doing a lot of work on the racial wealth gap. And through their research is how I came into kind of thinking about reparations as a policy solution. Um, at first, like very through the lens of the racial wealth gap, but over the years have obviously have expanded that thinking and now think about reparations, both obviously in terms of closing the racial wealth gap, but as a much, much broader or bigger project than that. Um, and then came to New York for grad school and um, was working at the ACLU of New York during that time on bail reform and legalizing marijuana. And we won on bail. And then a couple months later, the legislature rolled it back. And so to me, like it just really showcased and they wrote it back in large part because the New York Post and other outlets ran with anti-Black um, headlines. You know, New York is returning back to the 90s of crime and things of that nature. Um, and so to me, it just really crystallized like, you know, we'll win on the policy side, but until we kind of uproot anti-Blackness, until we change these narratives around Black criminality, uh, poverty, homelessness, as we're seeing right now, again, in New York City, um, we're just going to keep having these wins that will get rolled back. So then really got interested in this concept of like changing narratives, changing culture. Um, and yeah, worked in philanthropy for a little bit after grad, after grad school. I was at the Cerner Foundation for a little bit and then stumbled into this new org called Liberation Ventures that is trying to build and support the ecosystem of organizations working on reparations. So we do a little bit of grant making, but I'm the director of narrative change. Um, and so I'm focused on building narrative power throughout the reparations movement. And so really thinking about how we can, um, in our position, and um, build narrative power. And so we just did our first kind of narrative program called the Reparations Narrative Lab. Rich was a part of that, and it was um, a really great experience to try to create the space for alignment um, on a transformative, inviting, progressive narrative that can kind of um, bring more people into this into this movement. Nope, that was very efficient. Before, um, but no, I, I I like the import. I mean, this is a big part of this podcast. Like a lot of the conversations about reparations has been around, well, it's a policy issue, but like you said, policy issues are political, which means they're at the sway of the public and what they think about things. And that's where media comes in. Um, I think we had a similar thing in Illinois. Maybe you know this better than I do, Richard, but we had bail reform. And I think like as soon as it as enacted, there were all these like misinformation of narratives online and yeah. they started to walk it back. I don't know. I can't remember if they actually. Oh, it's true. Yeah, the Supreme Court is currently held up at the Supreme Court. So the bond, yep, yep, yep. So we were part of um, equity and transformation was part of the, I guess, the effort to move HB 3653, which was the Criminal Justice Reform Act introduced by the Black Caucus uh, during the uprisings around George Floyd's murder. Um, and yeah, most of the policy provisions within HB 3653, including prison gerrymandering and, um, you know, ending money bond in the state of Illinois have been held up um, by one way or another. Um, this is after the bill was signed, right, um, by the by Governor Pritzker, still held up. Um, and the most recent um, news I have on end money bond is that it was, uh, or the Pretrial Fairness Act, which is held up um, 
by the Illinois Supreme Court. Uh, so yeah, we, we will may. see. We will see. Yeah. Two steps forward, two steps back. I don't know what. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Richard, tell me about you know equity and transformation because it's really kind of a unique kind of organization in Illinois, maybe even nationally, um, in terms of trying to really think holistically about what reparations actually looks like, right? Yeah. So EAT, uh, Equity and Transformation, also known as EAT, uh, organization founded in 2018, uh, focusing on building power, right? I think where power needs to be built. Um, there are certain voices in our state and our city that are not um, included in the decision-making processes that we have access, you know, have access to through our democracy. Um, and for, for us, it was like essential that we bring those voices to the forefront. Um, in order to create the kind of changes um, that we we think are are possible in the state, um, and for us, those are black informal workers. Um, when you think about informality, you're talking about folks that are boxed out of the formal economy due to things like ableism, transphobia, homophobia, the mark of a criminal record, anti-black racism. People who literally cannot access the very system that our country was built. You know, that our country has created um, to provide food, water, and shelter, right? Like we can't just go build our own house if we cut down a few trees and and we can just build a house in the middle of Michigan Avenue if we wanted to, right? Like you have to go through a permitting process. You have to, you know, pay for the the supplies, all of that stuff. So it's not like a barter and trade community. We, we live under a system called capitalism. And so you have to exchange your labor for a wage um, in order to get the things you need to survive. And there's portions of our community um, that don't have access to that exact system. And so what they have done is they've created alternative routes to, you know, subsistence, right? To food, water, and shelter. Um, and that looks like, you know, hustling loose cigarettes like Eric, like Eric Garner. It looks like selling bootleg DVDs like Alton, um, Alton Sterling in New Orleans. It looks like uh, Jordan Neely street performing, right? These are folks who are boxed out of traditional, you know, I think are boxed out of the safety net um, in, in, in our country. Um, and so for me, um, it was like we had to bring those folks to the forefront uh, in order to create the types of change that would affect them. Um, and so we organize, we do base building, uh, policy development, advocacy. Three essential themes of our work are build, empower, and grow. We build alternatives. We empower Black and former workers through political education, personal development, leadership development. And we grow. So we started in Chicago and we want to you know, become statewide. We have a chapter in Joliet as well. That's awesome. And I want to make sure you answer the first question. And how did, how did you get into that work? Oh, wow. That's a long, my mama, <laughs> <laughs> my mom, my mom is a, um, a radical, uh, revolutionary. Um, you know, I grew up with, uh, brother Fred Hampton Jr. Uh, mama Akua. These were constant figures in my life. And so I also entered the streets. Um, you know, I was form I'm formerly incarcerated myself. Um, and so I think a lot of my analysis, even when it comes to like eat, you know what I mean? And the organization is like, we got to focus on the margins. And I feel like part of the reason why I focus on the margins, because I know what it feels like to live there. Um, and so over the years, um, you know, the efforts that we have looked at or, or, you know, I think my experience over the years from Ferguson to now has been, you know, this rally cry, rally cry by Black folks in the United States for change. And then the articulation of that rally cry into really ridiculous policy efforts that don't move the needle whatsoever. Um, and, you know, I was I was there for the passage of HB uh, 3653. I was there for, you know, the um, which, which was called the Illinois Breathe Act. And I was there for, you know, recreational cannabis legalization. I was there when Mike Brown was killed. And, you know, after all of those, all the civil unrest, we landed on body cams. Um, and and so for me, I'm like, at what point do we actually call on um, uh, like a universal demand for reparations whenever harm occurs in our communities? Um, and so, you know, after recreational cannabis legalization, which is one of the policies we fought for and won uh, in 2019, um, we won what they considered at the time one of the first uh, policies to incorporate reparations for the war on drugs. Um, and it was based in the UN's framework for reparations, right? We got compensation, we got some rehabilitation, we got restitution, 
I'm, uh, we got a guarantee. No, there was no guarantee of repetition. We'll talk about that in a minute, but we did get some satisfaction on some of the pillars. Right. Um, and then, and implementation, just like we thought with, you know, after the bill, after the governor signs the bill, it should just turn into what you said it was going to be in reality that didn't happen. Right. 2020 pandemic, most people weren't necessarily advocating on the, you know, on, on the political front as heavy as they were before. And a lot of things were lost in the fire. So we have um, lifted up what we call a drug war reparations campaign in the state of Illinois to uh, reassert, you know, what it was, what the initial interpretation of the bill was supposed to be. Um, and that was that we were supposed to compensate survivors, not nonprofits. That was that we were uh, committed to, um, you know, we had an idea around guarantee and non-repetition, right? Um, 800,000 folks come, you know, having the records expunged is not, you know, um, erase the experience of incarceration and um, harm. And so we want to go a, a bit further. And I, I can talk about that later, but that's essentially how we landed on this reparation framework. It was really through an arc of work and, and lived experience. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much. It's so important. I mean, there's so much to be done about repairing that work, including just allowing people to actually enter the formal economy and actually profit from the work that was formerly illegal and informal, right? Like I live on the South side of Chicago and there's there's no dispensaries down here. And yeah, I think the ones that are coming aren't black owned. So that's a problem. Um, and it's annoying. It's been what, two years since that bill was passed? It still hasn't happened. That was supposed to be a priority before it even came into being, right? So again, we see these kinds of policy slippages. So we will talk about that. Um, I wanna, you kind of talked a little bit about your strategies. And one of the reasons why I was really excited to talk to both of y'all is that you are strategists, right? You're not just about the high-minded theory. You're like, what do we need to get it done, right? And what do we need to actually affect change? So what for you, I'll pass this to you first, Trevor, what is it about liberations in terms of your strategies that you're most excited about, either in the organization in general or your work specifically within it? Yeah, first I'll talk, I'll talk about my work and then I'll talk about LV, um, or like the broader, broader LV work. Um, so at the, in how we define narrative power, we think about narrative power, we define it as the ability to tell stories that shift mental models, cultural mindsets, and ultimately cultures. And so thinking about, you know, how do we facilitate the growth of narrative power within a movement? Um, we, our theory of change falls into two buckets, um, building narrative infrastructure and narrative weaving. And so we started on the infrastructure side. And so I'll talk about that in, the se in a second um, with the Reparations Narrative Lab. Where we haven't started yet is on the narrative weaving side. And what we think about that, how we think about that is how do we create kind of narrative networks between social movements, identity, and or subcultures? So thinking about, and I think, you know, this is, I think this is actually, Rich is like a really good example of this. How do we create a network between folks who kind of self-identify as being in the abolitionist and abolition movements um, and folks who self-identify and are in the reparations movements? Because and from my perspective, they they do seem silo, they do seem fragmented, but obviously there's immense overlap, both in the histories, um, but then also right now in the current um, and what we're and what we're calling for. Um, so and not just so social movements, identity. I mean, I think there's a lot of kind of weaving to be done between um, like the the story of what it means to be like a young black person in this country and the topic of reparations, and then also subcultures. Um, you know, I'm really interested in thinking about can we, how can we reach like the beehive? Um, how can we reach and activate um, subcultures, particularly black, black subcultures? Um, and I think we saw that with um, Black Panther and how much kind of power and narrative power there was, there is to be harnessed through things like that. So the goal is to kind of hire more capacity so we can actually start to intentionally do this weaving because it is about relationships and identifying where relationships already are and where they can be um, where they can be empowered and how LV can help support that. So where we started was on the infrastructure side and we launched this program last year called the Reparations Narrative Lab. It's built on these four pillars um, that Rashad Robinson identified as being like key pillars of uh, narrative infrastructure. So it's learn, create, broadcast, immerse. And so we started on the learning and creating side and we brought together 13 um, organizers, strategists, researchers, writers, movement leaders from across the racial justice space. So fo both folks who are kind of squarely in the reparation space, but um, other folks as well. Um, 
And <clears throat> we commissioned some audience research. We had these lab sessions. We we're constantly asking ourselves, like, what are the narratives that we're up against as a movement? What are the narratives we want to see out in the world? And we started to co-create this narrative schema, this framework that we're calling the narrative house that we hope can be a tool for future storytelling and content creation and like creative action. Um, and we put the tool to test a bit with, we had like a writer's room, we had um, some content creators and uh, artists come into the lab and um, kind of use the narrative house as a, as a guide for a conversation with um, the lab members, with the activists. Um, and we created some, co-created some content with them and they put it out on their platform. Um, and then we tested that content. And now we're kind of analyzing that content. And the goal is really to support organizations um, to do kind of uh, research back storytelling and then also to create alignment. Because uh, there's obviously a lot of, as Rich can attest to, there's a lot of uh, landmines and questions to, to talk about um, consistently on the topic of reparations. And even though we talked for nine months, there's still a lot more to talk about. Um, but what we're hoping this framework can do is offer an invitation for a further conversation. Um, and I think, I think we've done a pretty good job of identifying kind of what, what could be an inviting, um, narrative that kind of seeks to push us path past some of these roadblocks, um, that kind of have always stood in the way on reparations. Great. I'm excited to get more into that uh, in a little bit. Um, but I want to talk about to pause back to Richard and ask you the same question about in terms of what EAT is doing now. You kind of gestured towards it, but if you want to say a little bit more about um, where you really see your focus over the next however long. Uh, yeah, for the next couple of years, um, we've been in a three, well, in a two year um, planning process to launch the, the big payback, which is a drug war reparations campaign. And I think because we had opened door, I mean, really the state op state of Illinois opened the door by standing on platforms and describing the, I mean, uh, HB 1438, the Recreational Cannabis Tax Act, as a bill that incorporated reparations for the war on drugs. And so due to them saying this, we are reaffirming to them what real drug war reparations looks like. Um, and for us, we we will spend the next, you know, hopefully in 2024, we will see some policy development um, and um, policy introduction um, that speaks to um, the use of cannabis tax revenue to provide direct cash payments to survivors of the war on drugs. Um, we will see some movement as it relates to um, addressing the collateral consequences of incarceration, right? So. Many people may come out and get their records expunged, but even arrests may still show up in your background checks, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so we are, we are, you know, we are, and, and background checks essentially serve as, uh, you know, it's the new Jim Crow, right? Uh, it serves as the reason we don't allow them to get employed, right? That's how they use it, right? Um, and so we want to, we want to address, you know, the eleven hundred permanent punishments and collateral consequences to incarceration. We want to see the creation of a protected class for formerly incarcerated people in the state of Illinois. And, um, you know, that's all encompanied or embodied in this uh, drug war reparation or vision for drug war reparations that we hope to release in August. Um, and, and, you know, so I think over the next few years, we will see, um, you know, we hope to win compensation, um, you know, immediately coming out the door. We already know there's 25% of, can of the cannabis tax revenue um, is an immense amount of money. I don't want to give you the wrong number. Um, and that's with the uh, cannabis industry operating at about, you know, one fifth of scale. Um, and so when you, when they actually get to the, the, you know, when you get a cannabis dispensary on the South side and you know what I mean? And they get them in, in the South suburbs and so on and so forth. This is a statewide policy. So we're talking about 25% of the total states uh, cannabis tax revenue. Um, and that we believe will serve as a, as a permanent, um, fund for survivors of the war on drugs and that survivors will receive direct cash payments. And so we believe that within the next two years, we can win that. Um, and that's what we're going to be focusing on. Um, yeah. So that's our work. Yeah. And you kind of led into my next question, which is, you know, what is y'all's vision for the field of reparations, right? You know, how, what do Black people need to heal from the historical harm. I mean, there have been so many historical harms, right? So kind of like what Trevor said, we can kind of keep going and going and going with what actually 
reparations can look like um, across all of the ways in which Black people um, and for a lot of other people, Indigenous people have been harmed in this country. You know, you kind of gestured toward this, Trevor, and I'm curious about your thoughts too, Richard, in terms of what are the narrative frames that you are noticing that can get people to think about this in a productive way, um, and maybe even an exciting way, right? Like, when I was writing my book, Reparative Media, which is really about the harms enacted by Hollywood and Silicon Valley on Black people, Indigenous people, and lots of other people, historically and in the present day, just even naming the harm kind of opened up whole worlds. Like naming what has happened as harm, um, as violence in some cases, um, opened up whole new ways of thinking about everything, you know? Cause we know just as humans, everyone, everyone in their life experienced some form of harm, you know? Even if it's just, you break in a finger or whatever, you know? And you know that you, you gotta do something about it, right? So it feels like the framework of repair is like something that people can understand, but I'm that's very broad, right? Um, so I'm curious, you know, what are you noticing? What are you experimenting with? And for that's for you, Trish, uh, Trevor, and then for you, Richard, like, what are your conversations like when you talk with people saying, y'all have named that there has been violence and harm. You've named the idea that there has to be repair. You know, what are the stumbling blocks? What are the things that you're saying? I don't know, if that makes any sense or if that's helpful. That's Trevor's alley. <laughs> that's, all, that's Trevor's lane right there. Go ahead, Trevor. Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, what I always lead with is that the government has always uh, historically subsidized white wealth and like sought to grow white wealth. And so I always point back to, or I often point back to the Homestead Act and how the government gave away swaths, swaths of acres and upon acres of land to mostly white families. And that what that wealth can literally be tracked um, to today, and so um, I usually start with that, and that just to try to help folks think about how this like that wealth wasn't kind of like magically created, that the wealth gap wasn't just like magically created, that white folks don't just work harder than black folks, um, that you know the through government policies um, wealth was created, and then through white violence. Black, black folks weren't able to, even after kind of uh, Black folks had pushed to make inroads, Black violence, both vigilant, vigilante violence and like law, um, like legal, you know, like legal institutions um, enacted violence on Black communities every time they took two steps forward. So just, I, I, I usually start by, you know, pointing the finger at the biggest culprit, which is the, the United States government. And then sometimes I, always, I even get into the, you know, Stolen land as well. Stolen land, stolen labor. That's what created the United States. Mm -hmm. um, and then obviously, you know, when folks want to, then folks want to get deeper and like, okay, well, what does it look like? And have some of these other questions. And this, that's the level that we we got into in the labs. And I, I do think Rich can speak to some of this as well. Um, because I think, you know, one of the things that always bubbles up to the top is, well, who should get it? Um, and because it's seen um, strictly through this financial lens. And usually what I try to do then in that com and when that comes up is to, to complicate it a little bit, well to, or to, to bring in uh, um, to bring in um, the, the thinking and the research that's been done around like racial capitalism. And you know, talk about the ways in which um, you know, the the ways in which racism and, and anti-blackness and the racial hierarchy um, are is interconnected to um, capitalism and capitalism as a system. Um, and so I do that to make the point that it is about the money, but then it is also about deconstructing the the system itself. And that is what leads to black liberation and black liberation is for all black people um and so that's kind of that's i feel like one of the biggest kind of uh points of where we where the conversation gets stuck right mm -hmm. now um and i think that's one way that i try to get folks unstuck by instead of just thinking about it as like a period and black folks being paid a certain amount for um harm that was caused think about it as like a comma and that if 400 plus years of harm was done, then we have to create 
400 years plus of something new. Yeah. Um, so it is about the money, but it's all, it should be about more than that. Yeah, it's definitely about the money. I was just joking with a friend of mine who's white and just casually in conversation, um, he mentioned like, oh yeah, my mom's lake house. And then he mentioned like, oh, my aunt and uncle's lake house. And I'm like, every white person got a lake house. <laughs> and I'm just like, how did y'all, where are all these lake houses? Like who's living in them? Um, so it is about money. It is about land, but it is, like you said, also about how we do things in capitalism, right? And when you really start to unpack it, a lot of the just norms of capitalism are rooted in colonization, anti-Blackness, et cetera. Um, and that's a big argument in my book. It's like, yes, Hollywood owes Black people money, and they also owe doing the business differently, right? Like the fact that no matter what skin color you have right now, if you want to work in Hollywood, you basically got to sell your intellectual property is literally colonization, right? Um, and that actually affects everybody, not just Black people. But let's start talking about the ways in which these systems disproportionately harm Black people and how that actually isn't good for it anybody in the first place. So I'm curious for you, Richard, if you make some of those arguments too, when you talk about supporting formerly incarcerated folks, it's like they formerly incarcerated folks just, just disappear, right? Like they live in society and by them being supported, it actually makes society better for everybody. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I like to think about reparation as a framework for life. You know, I think we, we, we live in a society that is hell bent on punishment as a form of, uh, reconciliation, right? That's so far source, right? It's like we're gonna punish them until, you know, and that and that they unlearn the behavior through punishment. Um and 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 I think the way that I look at reparations is that, you know, when a harm I I would love to live in a world where when a harm was occurred, the immediate framework that people shifted to was reparations. In that moment they think about, okay, well, you harm this person, so how are you going to rehabilitate this person? How are you going to restore this person? How are you going to guarantee that this person this is, that this will never happen again? How are you going to compensate that person for whatever it is that you might have done? And then lastly, you know, what does satisfaction mean for that person? Right. And so we don't live in a state like that. Right? Our carceral system isn't built on a system of reparations or repair. It's built on a system of like punishment. Right. And, 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 then, and then in addition, to, you don't actually get to the root causes of, of whatever the activity might have been. And there's very little accountability between the perpetrator of the harm and the survivor. The, the accountability is actually paid to the state. Mm -hmm. um, the reparations is paid, you know what I'm saying? It's paid to the state. And so for me, you know, when, when I think about our work around drug war reparations, you know, it's a framework that is, um, you know, I think every time that, you know, like Evanston has this housing reparations initiative. And I think that we need to normalize reparations as a frame, as a response, right, in, in society. Like when harm occurs, it's not something we should be embarrassed of or run away from. I think shame and guilt is why we have so much tension in our world right now. Mm -hmm. The reality is like we need people to lean into and be held accountable for the harm that they've done. And that does not mean that you will never do, you know what I mean? Like that you can never be repaired. You can never be, you know, um, you can never be brought back. Right. Um, it's just that you acknowledge the fact that you you messed up. Right. And then you're going to go through the necessary steps to repair that. And for me, you know, I think that's the way we're, we're walking through the drug war reparations framework in Illinois, because, again, you know, like, um, you know, this is, you know, it's, it's a unique, you know, um, the, the war on drugs affected tons and tons of people. And so carving out like, you know, who are the actual survivors of the war on drugs and being able to earmark dollars to those communities, which has already been done because the state of Illinois created a, a, a map. So essentially what you know is that you can't apply for a license in the state of Illinois unless you come from one of these particular communities, which they, the state's defined as disproportionately impacted areas. Um, and so for us, the state's kind of done a lot of the legwork. Um, we're, we're just going to make them, you know, fulfill or satisfy, mm -hmm. right, that commitment to drug war reparations um, in the state of Illinois. And, um, and yeah, and I think as we think about, you know, the, 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 the windfall of activity around reparations that's occurring right now, I think it's it's a it's a recipe for living at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. um, and I, and I appreciate all of the different initiatives that are popping up where they are calling on reparations as the as the response to a particular harm occurring. Yeah, I love that a recipe for living. It really is, um, and it's something that I 
it's a kind of point that I very quickly realized when I got into the book that it wasn't just about, okay, this institution did this thing, so they should pay back this, but actually from the top down and everywhere in between, we all need to be living through that ethic, right? And I think 2020 is when I sort of shifted that narrative towards harm. And it was in 2020 when like, because maybe we were all at home, everyone just started to become more aware of all the harm, right? And more people got called out everywhere. I mean, in every sector, and some people learn to just take accountability, right? Like they realize, oh, actually the best and easiest thing is just to take accountability and ask the people I've harmed, what do you need? Um, and I'm noticing that a little bit more often as just a like just seeing random friends like take accountability for harm, you know, when even not even major things, just like interpersonal stuff, just like publicly taking accountability. I think it's an important kind of, like you said, building that culture of this is just what we do. Um, and it's, I think people, it's a huge weight off your chest once you take accountability and take those steps. Now, all of a sudden you can move on, move forward and think about the future, right? It's actually, it's it's not as harm, like hard and like difficult and stressful as people think it is. It is, it is that, right? But it also is kind of like exciting. Like, oh, now we have an opportunity, you know, to do something different, to act differently, um, which kind of leads me to my next question, you know, for either of you, whoever feels inspired, you know, what role do culture and media and technology play in your vision for, you know, reparations and just futures for Black people? Um, in what ways could those, secondary question, you know, in what ways could those systems, the systems of culture, and media, technology, including like journalism and whatnot, in which ways could they help you more? Um, yeah. I can start because I'm brief here and I'll let Trevor go in depth because there's a lot of work that has been done in the lab around this. Um, I think, you know, I think when, if, if media in moments where crisis happens, um, where harm has occurred with Black people, um, Jordan Neely, um, George Floyd, these massive moments of unrest, if they would lean into the use of reparations as a solution to this harm, right? What happens, and I've seen it happen time and time again, is that, you know, and I think we spoke about this before, is that the, you know, I remember when there was a mass shooting at a school, and I remember I saw the arc of the media going from, you know, we need to, you know, you know, ban weapons in the United States, right? And then they made the first concession, it was like, well, how about we just ban assault rifles, right? And the state was like, no, no, no. Okay, well, then how about we just ban, um, I forget, it was bump stocks. Because they were saying mm -hmm. that because he had the right, the, the, the assault, because he had a bump stock, he was able to shoot the gun as many times as he did. And then even with, and so, you know, the elected officials went out on, on the news and we're going to ban bump stocks. And everybody was like, yay. And I was like, how do we land there? How did we that art, how did we land there? So in my mind, I think about this drug war, I mean, think about reparations as being something that we need the, the media to begin to speak about on a regular basis, a framework for the media to be begin to think about or or um to respond, a media from which the the I mean a, a framework in which the media could respond from to talk about specific harms that are happening to black people. Right. There needs to be like a deep education with media um media anchors etc um around this framework and how we can begin to think about the different harms that are occurring as being um as being connected to um the historical harms and the, the, the historical i don't want to use it, how to say it but i'm saying what, I, what i'm trying to say is that they need to be speaking about the harms. so say for instance george floyd and that this be this being because of America's inability to um, fulfill reparations uh, for chattel slavery, right? And that this is connected. It's all connected. The devaluing of black life started with chattel slavery. So when an officer takes his gun out and shoots a black man, it is connected to the devaluing, which is the three fifths clause. It is, it's all connected. Right. Um, and so for me, I feel like even when they talk about intra-community violence, right, I want you to connect that to the, the inability of the state of Illinois to provide reparations for the war on drugs. When you see 
unemployment statistics, when you see housing crises, when you see homelessness, right, in our communities, I need you to be able to make the connection between homelessness today in 2023 and chattel slavery, right? And so that is, you know, I think if there's anything um, that I can call on the media to do is to do a deep dive and make those connections so that next time, which we, we all know will happen, um, this will happen again. Um, they can actually have a framework to actually speak from that gets to the root, right? And actually moves us towards um, uh, repair um, opposed to just some symbolic gesture of that does not change the material conditions of black people whatsoever. Um, and so, <laughs> you know, that's, that's essentially what I, I would say here. Yeah, it kind of connects to what you were saying earlier in terms of we live in a punitive society. So when something bad happens, we just think, well, what can we ban? What's the like thing that we can like police, right? And it's like, well, when you actually get to the root causes, the solutions aren't banning always, most of the time. It's actually more, it's actually more of a positive thing. What can we do positively to actually stop this from happening? Um like even a lot of these mass shooters now are just coming out with their white supremacist views. And it seems like no one talks about that as a motivating force, right? And how, isn't that connected to the fact that y'all don't wanna teach race in schools, <laughs> right? Like, why isn't that part of this restitution and this solution? Um, it's kind of, when you think about it, it's kind of like mind boggling, you know, it's like police keep shooting black people, but no one says, well, where did policing come from? And how can maybe reform just that whole thing that we be, that we do, which, you know, Ava DuVernay already did the documentary and showed y'all that policing comes from slave catching and, you know, anti-blackness. Um, so and the, there's a little bit of education of history too that clearly has to happen as well. Um, so yeah, I'm curious what you what you have to say to this big question, Trevor. <laughs> I'm really glad. <laughs> Rich up, I'm really glad Rich brought up guns because that was the first thing that my mind went to just in gun violence. You can't like we live in a culture right now where you can literally make a mistake and go to the wrong door, like an honest mistake and get shot. You could make a mistake and open the wrong door on a car. It was a little white girl and she got shot. And then we live in a culture that lets little kids, black kids, white kids, you could walk up into the school and shoot these little kids and we don't do anything about it. It's it's insane to me that we live in a culture that allows that. And to me, reparations, abolition, land back, these are loving transformative movements that can heal, like that, that can heal some of heal us and push us close, closer to a like a, a loving culture. Um, we don't love each other. Um, we do not have community with each other. Um, where we can make these honest mistakes. And because we have so much kind of like hatred and fear of each other we shoot each other for on for on, literal honest mistakes um and so i think you know we the these movements though they get they get uh, villainized right reparations movements and all the organizers in it get villainized rich brought this up on the last call through the traditional media through traditional media outlets um uh and we are so reliant on them in the nonprofit industrial complex to tell our stories. we I had full-time jobs dedicated to pitching the New York Times, pitching the Washington Post, pitching the New York Daily News. And what I think reparations, land back, abolition, what these movements can help us think about and is we don't need them. We don't mm -hmm. need these outlets necessarily. They obviously hold power and they obviously have a platform. But I think what all of these movements seek to do is like transform uh, who gets to tell stories mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and putting and, and shifting the value of, um, of stories. Because right now within the capitalist system, especially black story or well, anti-blackness sells. Um, so anti-blackness sells in the way in which the our reality TV shows are constructed and all the reality TV shows about black people seek to, to cast us in a bad light. I like some of them, but there's a whole other reality of black folks, right? Um, and so there's that, um, just like, I think there's, uh, the media both has a role in 
repairing the harm that it has done in perpetuating anti-blackness and then also i think hospicing itself honestly mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and then we need to create new institutions that um aren't rooted in all the things that um this old system uh, is rooted in and we need new new focus areas new beats i've i've said like i would love there's all these crime reporters all of these crime reporters there's no uh mutual mutual aid reporter or cooperative reporter you know the we what we what we deem the mundane should actually be seen as stories that we value so what are the ways in which we help each other every day and have people report on that instead of the ways that we harm each other every day yeah and then like just i think like the last thing is I'm really interested in um, artists, cultural makers, and celebrities and the role they should be playing in these movements. I was thinking about this earlier, knowing I was we were going to talk today. Who is like who is the modern day Muhammad Ali? Like I look up so much to Muhammad Ali and what he stood for and how he kind of told you I'm the best in the ring, but I'm not just a boxer. And I stand for so much else and I won't be controlled by you whether it's in the ring or outside of the ring and this is what i stand for outside of the ring and i i I know i know we have a ton of athletes a ton of artists who are uh engaged um on issues but i was just wondering i was like who is the closest thing that we have to muhammad ali today and i i couldn't i don't i don't know who i didn't know who to think of and so i just think that in, in thinking about the history of black cultural makers I'm really interested in re-radicalizing or radicalizing some of the biggest, like I think LeBron James should, LeBron James should be a part of the reparations movement and could have immense impact as a person. And when I think about culture, I also think about people like that. Yeah, that's totally true. I mean, we know that people do less, younger people, maybe less so, but certainly a lot of people still trust these figures that we venerate. When you asked who was the modern day Muhammad Ali, I was thinking about Colin Kaepernick, who was mm-hmm. probably the last one, but I think a lot of other athletes saw how he got punished right. and got scared, right? Um, and I think people also have to be brave too, especially when you already have money and power. Um, you should be brave because a lot of people out here don't have that and are being brave. And when you were talking about the narratives that journalism perpetuates, makes me think of another podcast that I'll be releasing around this time with um, one of the editors of The Tribe, which is a local Black news publication here in Chicago. And we were talking about some of their coverage and how they do things differently. And one of the things that um, Tiffany told me is that when she was trained as a journalist, she was never trained to interview organizers. You know, they those crime reporters, they call the police first. That's where they get the story from. And that's oftentimes the only source on the story. Um, and... She said that it was when she started working with Morgan, who was a documentary filmmaker, she realized that bias that she had and the tribe does platform organizers. And sometimes they make the organizers the journalists. Like I think they did this interview with Lori Lightfoot, Bella Baz. And honestly, it was the best interview of Lori Lightfoot that has ever been done from an organizer, not from a journalist, because she asked the real questions. She asked her questions that she wasn't getting elsewhere. Um, So I think it is about who you listen to um, in the media and whose stories do you actually value I think it was Rashad's um, organization, Color of Change, that did the police study of looking at all the police shows on TV and how often there isn't restorative justice, police do things that are illegal and they aren't punished for it, right? Like how much, just so much of our narratives reproduce this idea that police can do no wrong. um, When of course we know that that's not the truth, like open the newspaper any day, right? And we know that's not the truth. Um, for me, it goes to what you're talking about. Like, ultimately, can we convince NBC to not platform Dick Wolf? You know, can we convince the New York Times to hire a mutual aid reporter? Probably not. Um, so we do need to invest in an alternative. I want, I, I, that's an important campaign. Somebody's got to do it. But also we need to invest in organizations like the tribe, right? Like organizations like OTV that are Black run that are actually telling stories differently and have a different perspective on the culture. Because I don't think we're really going to get there with corporate capitalism owned by white people. It's just, we have too much evidence that it takes too much work for them to think about things differently. So we might need just some folks who are more organically tied to the world that we need. Um, for 
my last question, how can people help? How, what can people do? If you're listening to this podcast, you're probably someone who's interested in media and technology. Maybe you write, um, maybe you work in some one of these organizations. What can people do to support and advance the work that y'all are doing? I'll start. Yeah, to the point you just raised is, yeah, we need control of the means of production. All of it, you know, and, I, I, and I'm sorry, I'm going to just take a couple seconds to talk about that because it's, it's, it's pressing. You know, the conditions now and the conditions when Muhammad Ali um, was in was in motion are a bit different in the black community. Um, and you would think that years later that the conditions would actually be better, but the fabric of our interpersonal relationships have, has, has deteriorated in some in some particular ways um, due to anti-black racism, due to the backlash of the Fred Hamptons and the Malcolm X's and the Martin Luther King's and the Muhammad Ali's has been a very strategic um, um, dismantling of, 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 of community. Um, that has us in, you know, I think scarcity plays a part in um, the decision-making of, you know, our athletes and our musicians um, and, and, their, and their inability to be held by an infrastructure if they do step off. That's the challenge is like, what is the infrastructure that's going to hold me if I do take this leap of faith and begin to be an advocate for this? Um, it is um, what I've witnessed is that those, you know, those those experiences that we hold our people down for about six months. Um, and then we're on to the next topic because we're so, in, you know, you know what I mean? Like the shade room, you know, pop it up. You know what I mean? It, it's a thing for a while. And then it's like, we still talking about this. Right. Um, and and we need to build the you know I think the muscle to hold our people long term and that's do and I think that 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 comes by way of um, infrastructure. Um, they need to see these these alternatives built. They need to see the tribe as being the media outlet of of Illinois. They need to see you know all the alternatives that we could possibly dream of. Um, a lot of the things that we're fight. I mean, and that has everything to do with the nature of our fight, which is a fight against. Um, and if we you know, we we do the work of building the alternatives. They're actually doing a fight away and upward. It's like it's like this. Like we're stepping away and then we're going up. You know what I mean? And so sometimes we're like afraid to do that, and so we choose to just continue to go up this and then get knocked down, get knocked down. We're trying to do this, build something different. So that's that. Um, and what folks can do now is, you know, we got a petition. You can go to www.eatchicago.org, sign the petition. You can show up to the drug war reparations forums that we're having throughout the state of Illinois. You can check our websites for updates there. You can go to our, uh, you can donate to equity and transformation. we got a donor box link on our website. Um, if you don't want to, you know, come out and join the rallies or the forums, you can drop a few dollars in the basket. You know, it's, it's kind of like Titan um, and <laughs> put it on a reoccurring basis if you want to. Um, and, you know, I would, I would say to anyone who's interested in, in, in learning more about the work, um, I could point you to a million books, um, um, but I'd much rather point you to a million people. Mm -hmm. um, and so my, 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 my assignment to anybody who listens to this is to, to get involved in a local organization that's fighting for change. Um, move those people towards reparations, read up on reparations, but get involved in the, in the work. Meet your people. Say hello to your neighbors. You know, those type of things are are, are, are the, the antithesis of what the state wants us to do. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, go to 79th, go to Madison and Pulaski, meet to people, you know, provide, you know, join an organization, check out our website, all of that good stuff. Love it. Ashe. Trevor? I mean, yeah, same thing. I'm, I always say, like, um, use your time, use your voice, and use your dollars. Um, but I think before I even get into that, what I, I guess I'll say is, you know, there's two, there's two, I think very, um, there's two stories or two areas that folks can look into. Um, and I think Chicago is definitely one of them. And, um, you know, you can look into the campaign um, for reparations for um, police torture uh, survivors. And there's a great Washington Post article. There's, I think, a ProPublica article. And then there's a bunch of stuff on the Chicago Torture Justice Center on their page. And I think it just really, it, it really crystallizes like how real this is and has been. Um, and, and, and then obviously, you know, given in the context of 2020, you can, folks can think about, okay, well, where are we now? 
And then in thinking about where are we now, you know, you can go to Liberation Ventures website and see, we don't, we funded 31 organizations um, in our past two years, but there's a ton of other organizations out there in this ecosystem. And so I think, you know, in, in terms of using your time, if there's a organization in your um, in your city or in your state that um, you see on our site, folks are always looking for volunteers, always looking for help, dollars, as Rich said, you know, fund these organizations directly. Um, uh, and then your voice, you know, I think everyone has a voice, especially in these, in these days with social media, you could go viral tomorrow. So uh, if you're speaking about reparations, you know, uplift the, the, the uplift, like things that we talked about in this, in this conversation, um, and, you know, study and then go out there and use your voice and in, in support of reparations. Yes, you got to do it. You got to use your voice. You can, wherever you are, whatever you do, you have a role to play because this stuff is systemic. So it's everywhere. Um, so whatever you do, it's going to be helpful. I really believe that. Um, thank you so much for talking with me, educating our audience uh, and spending the time. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having us. Uh,